The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Welcome to Lesson 4 of the Massive Open Online Orchestration Course, Term 1. I'm your instructor, Thomas Goss. It's hard to imagine, but we've reached the halfway mark in this course. That's perfect, because today's lesson represents a turning point, from which we begin our departure from the scoring of individual instruments, and start to take on true ensemble scoring. Consider the last three assignments. Two were dedicated to scoring unaccompanied works for solo instruments, the violin and the cello, with unaccompanied viola to come next lesson. We also took on the violin-piano duo in lesson two. But a duo isn't really an ensemble. With only two people playing, the music becomes a dialogue, with two players alternating roles of support and leadership. We humans are used to this way of communication. Two people sharing ideas is a relationship, a conversation, an interview, or even an argument. But it's not a party, it's a date. If you add just one more person, then you have the beginnings of a musical party. As they say, three's a crowd. And to my way of thinking, three is the number at which the term ensemble should start. In a really good conversation between three people, we get to hear each person's point of view. Someone makes a statement or shares a perspective, and their comrades react in different ways, by supporting that statement or giving it a bit of their own spin or even interjecting an opposite opinion. In the best of circumstances, this removes the attention from any one person, and the development of the conversation becomes a concerted effort, which may go to quite unexpected places. So too with great trio composition, as I hope to show in the upcoming lecture. Just one little piece of business first. If you've missed Lesson 3 on unaccompanied cello scoring, then I'll just mention once again that the course schedule has been changed from specific dates to a more general calendar of two lessons per month plus a supporting video designed to help you along with your efforts. From what I've seen, my recently released video on creative stamina proved useful to both MOOC students and the general orchestration online crowd. The next video lesson on unaccompanied viola scoring will be released around the middle of August, along with some advice on forming composer groups. Then, end of August through end of September, we'll see the release of the final three videos in this course, which will expand on the concept of what the term ensemble truly means and how to form your own individual scoring approach. I'll release a video in September on the psychology of playing music in a group of other musicians, from the big orchestras all the way down to those groups who may be reading your MOOC scores soon. With that out of the way, let's take a look at piano trio scoring. Over the past three lessons, we've covered a lot of ground. In lesson one, we forged a basic approach to unaccompanied scoring by addressing the three key elements of bowing, melodic phrasing, and contrasts of register. Then in lesson one, we progressed those approaches to include all forms of tone production, and to consider how the quality of register affects melodic phrasing among other issues. In the middle of all this, Lesson 2 explored the nature of instrumental roles, and how to form these roles into scoring approaches along with several other issues, such as contrasting the identities and qualities of the instruments, exploring the relationships between roles, and the source of motivating energy in a musical passage. All of these factors play an evolving part in understanding piano trio scoring, with one added category, alliances based on roles, instrumental characters, and musical structures. Probably the best way to understand how alliances work in piano trio scoring, along with many of our previously studied approaches, is to take a historical overview of the form. The piano trio is an enormously successful chamber music genre, with many composers contributing first-rate repertoire to it in all periods since the early classical era. In fact, there are so many great piano trios in the repertoire that it's hard, even for me as your teacher, to select out which to study first. 
To really get a comprehensive view of the form, you'd have to listen to at least a couple dozen trios, and I hope you do someday, but we don't have time for that in this course. So with a great deal of regret, I've selected a mere six works across a period of 130 years to illustrate the evolution of scoring approaches along the lifeline of the piano trio. But why was the piano trio so popular? The answer to that question partially lies in convenience. Whether a group of dedicated amateurs are throwing a musical party, or a few experienced musicians want to organize a chamber performance, this particular instrumentation is one of the simplest and most effective combinations. The violin, the cello, and the piano are each among the most popular instruments ever studied, so it's far easier to put together a group of these musicians at short notice. But more than that, they have a wonderfully complementary effect when combined, offering a sound that can be full and rich, or highly varied in texture. For a developing orchestrator, the piano trio can provide a microcosm of how a much larger ensemble functions. of chamber music are complexly linked with Haydn. He pioneered many of the ensembles we take for granted today, maybe not inventing them himself, but seizing on the possibilities of early examples and fixing their forms and establishing their direction for composers to follow. When you look at his compositions, you take away a lot of information about the nature of early classical music performance practice. For instance, in many of Haydn's early string quartets, the first violin parts lead the music, and the other parts rarely do anything but support. This would suggest that capable string players were hard to come by, and it was safer and easier to score simpler parts for them, with the first violinist guiding nearly every aspect of the music. However, in his piano trios, it's the pianist that takes the lead, with the violin and cello serving merely as extensions of the central piano score. The cello follows the bass part as laid down by the pianist's left hand, while the violin largely doubles or decorates the right-hand melody. When the string parts do stand out, they serve to lighten the texture and freshen interest, but rarely function as independent parts with any long-term continuity. All the same, Haydn crafts the interdependence of these parts with enormous interest, making his trios great to play, especially for students and amateur players. And yet their artistic depth is thoroughly rewarding at the professional level. Once again, the forte piano of the classical era was far more modest in tone than today's concert grand, so Haydn's approach wasn't necessarily about making the string parts subservient to the piano's role. The strings were there to literally amplify the piano part, making it easier to hear. I feel this is also why there's so little interplay between parts. The strings actually dominate the conversation with the forte piano involved. When we hear passages in which the instrumental functions have a greater degree of separation, they're still carefully balanced so as not to cross each other's ranges too much or step on each other's toes acoustically. The sense of interdependence is maintained. <laughs> Even
Even though the forte piano continued to evolve and gained strength and clarity of tone throughout Haydn's life, he still maintained his scoring approach of a mostly unified alliance of parts. The piano quartet we just sampled, your first score reading assignment of this lesson, was composed as late as 1795, when the composer was in his early 60s, but its approach is of a piece with trios he composed many years earlier. Meanwhile, his best friend Mozart was tinkering with the form, making use of the piano's improvements and his own gifts as a performer to craft works that had a strong resemblance to his violin-piano duo sonatas. One of my favorites is the piano trio in B-flat, Kirchel 496. It's clear what's going on from the very beginning. Mozart is hosting a musical house concert. He makes his grand entrance, stating the main theme and adding a few flourishes just to establish his easy virtuosity. In a live performance, he might have added quite a few more flourishes, as performer composers tended to improvise over their scored material back in the day. Then the violinist enters with a reiteration of the thematic material, with Mozart dropping down to a supporting role with the cellist. Stylistically, the language is very close to Haydn, but the difference in approach sets it apart immediately and paves the way for further improvements, as we'll see later in the lesson. Notice how the cello dropped out of that last bar? At least in this trio, Mozart assumes that the cellist is a bit of a beginner. The music may well have been composed for a specific house party in which the violinist was quite capable, but the cellist only of amateur ability, however enthusiastic. Mozart still gives them a part that's worth striving to play, but that won't spoil the party too much if they miss a few notes. I love the ending of the first movement, in which all three players show a degree of independence that's far ahead of Haydn's scoring. As you listen, notice how easily and naturally the instruments exchange roles, and how simple yet effective the support roles are crafted. This same general approach is maintained in the third movement's theme and variations, with the violin and piano parts bantering the melody around over the cello's constant support. And such is also the case, it would seem at first, with the andante second movement. But after long passages of cadenza-like expostulation by violin and piano, the cello enters the picture as an equal voice. Mozart is generous to his amateur trio partner and gives him something to really practice up. 
Beethoven studied directly under Haydn in his early days in Vienna. But even from the beginning with his Opus 3 piano trios, he liberated his parts far more than his teacher, and trusted his cellists far more than Mozart. By the time of his full maturity as a composer, he evolved the piano trio to its fullest form of expression, exploring nearly every useful general approach in his scoring. I'm very happy to assign perhaps his greatest piano trio, the Opus 97 in B-flat, for your score reading. The arrangement of the parts gives a completely different feel to the music from Haydn and Mozart. As to the cellist, it's almost as if a completely new color had been added to the music, freed from its subservient doubling of the pianist's left hand. Beethoven takes a revolutionary step in his piano trios by allowing the string players to form a natural alliance. It seems obvious to us today, but it took hundreds of piano trios by his predecessors just to get to this inevitable outcome. Instead of a musical landscape based on strictly functional relationships, Beethoven gives us rich, deep textures, getting the most out of the lush tone of combined strings. And by giving each player a nearly equal role at all times, the development of the musical ideas becomes ever more convincing. Did you notice how that previous passage from the scherzo movement was played mostly sol C on the cello and sol G on the violin? What a dark, searching quality it had. The marking of individual strings like sol C and sol G wasn't really a big concern as yet for composers, but Beethoven scores with a keen ear for contrasts of register and individuality of string tone, building these approaches naturally into his parts. Note this lovely duet between violin and cello in the opening of the Andante movement. The close harmonization in this register means that the violin will be playing mostly on its gentler D string and the cello on its soulful A string. 
It's a beautiful blend of string characteristics when balanced insightfully, as it is here. When introducing the Mozart trio, I hypothesized that he intended it for a specific performance and co-performers, and it probably was. In the case of this trio, there's no doubt whatsoever. Beethoven composed this mighty work in honor of his faithful patron Archduke Rudolf, and played the piano part at the premiere. Unfortunately, his hearing loss had become so problematic that the whole affair was a bit of a fiasco, and Beethoven would never perform again as a pianist. Sadly. He also closed the door in this form as well, and never composed another piano trio. But his compelling example influenced other composers to adopt his scoring approaches. One such was Schubert, who composed two piano trios near the end of his short life. Interestingly, Ignaz Schupanzig, the same violinist who premiered Beethoven's Archduke piano trio, also premiered Schubert's second piano trio, Opus 100. Beethoven's trios were like epic four-act plays but Schubert's trios were like Russian novels, lasting the better part of an intensely interwoven hour. Schubert doesn't have the patience for Beethoven's intrigue, and he doesn't even try. Instead, he composes straight from the heart, with huge flowing strings of melody. His developments are more about emotional contrast than motivic development. Notice the slow evolution here of roles. Though the pianist still contributes a great deal to the leadership of the music, the natural lyricism of the string parts puts that pianist ever more into the traditional role of accompanist as we understand it today. That might be somewhat instinctive to Schubert's scoring approach as the composer of over 600 songs for voice and piano, but the direction of his piano scoring of his last years in works such as the impromptus is also present here. Chordal melodies, cushions of harmony, and a sense of the orchestral and occasionally operatic, and always deep personal meaning and an awareness of his time and culture. It's little wonder that Schubert had a devoted crowd of fellow Viennese connoisseurs who collected his scores, including Beethoven himself. Thank you. 
have noticed here, Schubert varies his textures with a will, adding frequent pizzicato and different articulation styles. His melodic phrasing is full of interest and life, as in the canon that starts the third movement, pitting the pianist's two hands against the echoing string players. Note how the cellist keeps it fresh with pizzicato support instead of slavish imitation. Beethoven and Schubert both left a deep impression on the coming Romantic generation. Many well-known composers of the 19th century composed at least one piano trio. Felix Mendelssohn wrote two, and his sister Fanny one. Robert Schumann composed three, and his wife Clara Schumann a single trio in G minor. All are excellent and worth hearing. Tchaikovsky's piano trio is superb as well. In a rare moment of chamber music inspiration, Chopin also composed a piano trio which is noteworthy for a generous cello part, not to mention a piano part that requires virtuosity of the highest merit to perform. And let's not even mention Dvorak, who wrote four. But I'm reserving our view of this period to a composer whose piano trios really stand out in mastery of form and scoring approach, Johannes Brahms. His final trio, written at age 53 in 1886, sums up a lot of the Romantic era in one piece, along with his own thoughts about the genre. The first movement is immensely serious, taking advantage of the natural alliance between string players that Beethoven introduced, but played against a piano part with the blocky ferocity of Brahms's concerto scoring. There's something hugely symphonic about this music. Here we touch on the enormous potential of the piano trio to express something nearly orchestral in scope, and why it's such an attractive vehicle for reducing larger scale arrangements down to its numbers. The piano trio can emulate the force of an orchestral tornado, or achieve the subtlest of delicate coloration, as we'll see with the Ravel ahead. All the same, the score explores many principles of scoring we've studied in detail. In the following excerpt from the first movement, the violin and cello parts mostly maintain the same string relationship, starting from their richest, lowest strings, and then gradually ascending to their third and then second strings. Some of this is inevitable, of course, if the instruments are playing octaves, but Brahms is intentionally scoring to string color here, and the results are remarkable. One of the most haunting and unforgettable moments in the whole piano trio genre occurs in the second movement, where muted strings play support to a cleanly stated octave piano line. 
This music could easily be orchestrated with great effect. This whole trio is a veritable raft of great scoring ideas, and experiments that work. Don't miss the third movement, with a mixed meter of one bar of 3-4, followed by two of 2-4, essentially 7-4 time. Brahms trades off luxurious string duos with piano solos, not really coalescing as an ensemble until the middle 9-8 plus 6-8 section, essentially 15-8 or a triplet 5-4. Here you can study nearly every approach I laid out at the beginning of this video, but in an intriguing context. Notice how beautifully the cello plays a left-hand piano line. Orchestration manuals often refer to this ability by cellos. Now here is a standout example. Observe the superb melodic phrasing here, and how it contributes to the meaning and development of the music. Watch live performers to see how the string players alter the bowing so that they can push into the middle of the phrase with growing strength and come out with a naturally relaxing down bow. There's an enormous amount of information in these four simply, uniquely scored pages if you just listen for it. At the end of the 19th century and the start of the 20th, significant piano trios were written by many of the great French composers, like Franck, Saint-Saëns, and Faure. Cécile Chaminade composed two piano trios, of which the second is among the finest of its kind. That's another trio I wish we had time to include, along with Boulanger's trio arrangements of her works, which really stand on their own despite the intricate orchestrations from which they're derived. But I think you'll find your time won't be wasted by studying the Ravel, which is possibly the greatest of them all, every bit the summation of that period's approach to piano scoring as the Brahms's trio was for the Romantics. Ravel puts the very best of his own voice into the trio, with piano writing that could easily have been the basis of another great solo piece or even a piano concerto. Or the whole work might have easily become a great piece of orchestral repertoire. Note the opening in 8-8 time. Ravel has set up an internal metric scheme of 3 plus 2 plus 3, a pulse that feels like odd time even though it essentially adds up to the equivalent of common time. Immediately we see one of Ravel's trademarks, cello and violin in a two-octave unison, giving the melody an open, searching quality that it would lack if played only an octave apart. Here the piano avoids directly doubling the melody with its octave chords, and instead harmonizes in different inversions from the inside. It's a moment that's wonderfully evocative.
Ravel runs the gamut of string effects, with harmonics, pizzicato, mutes, arpeggiando bowing, sol G, and tremolo. The opening of the finale movement is particularly stunning, with arpeggiando natural harmonics from violin, and treble register tremolo intervals from cello. The whole movement is an exploration of exotic pulsing and swirling colors, yet has a clear, compelling structure. It's Ravel at his best. <laughs> This trio really deserves its own lesson, if not each movement, but I'll let you uncover its treasures on your own. As you go, think about what the instruments are really doing, how they're depending on one another or opposing one another, and how those actions move the music forwards. Once you've score read all six works on the curriculum list, then score your own piano trio composition. The parameters for this work are consistent with previous assignments, two to three minutes, keeping the work in your own voice and genre, and so on but I want you to really connect the idea of musical alliances to the concept of form. Now I don't want you to compose a miniature sonata allegro, but I do want the interaction of the instruments to drive the unfolding of the music's direction and energy. You've had some great examples in this lesson, and I'm sure you can think up many more of your own. Maybe this work could even be the basis of a full-length piano trio in the future, and this exercise could serve as a kind of demo or preliminary sketch that could interest performing groups who might even commission you to finish it. When you prepare your final score, use the same layout as violin-piano duo scoring, but just add a cello right under the violin part, also as a miniature staff. Look for sensible page turns for the pianist. If the string parts are running to several pages, then your work might be a little too long for a casual reading, but don't let that stop you if the inspiration is white hot. Give it your best effort, and I'll be back next month with a lesson on the viola. <laughs>